as we come to the passage this morning, and uh, we'll talk about this a little bit, that uh, this will be, I believe, the longest message that I have ever given. Now, before any of you run screaming from the building, um, it's going to be the longest message I've ever given, uh, so long that it's going to take me, I think, three or four weeks to complete, just not all at once, those of you who are, who are wondering. <clears throat> because the this morning, the message is, is, is um, living as light, or to live as light. And as we've gone through this, and we're going to do a little bit of a go back from last week, but this, uh, this thing that Paul has been building to um, is this, this practical living out what it means to be children of God, what it means to live as new creations. And, and I'm hopeful that as we go forward, you'll see that, that sometimes these passages that we teach in isolation from each other are interconnected to what it means to live as children of God, to live as light in this dark world. Last week, we, we talked about being um, oil and vinegar and the fact that we as believers are in the world, but not of the world, that we, we are, um, and we'll look at the, the quote again, that we are in this world and we live our lives for God in a way that we are uh, in contact with the world in the right way and not in contact with the world in the wrong way. That, uh, as some would say, we do not allow any egg to be put into our oil and vinegar mixture, lest the bonds be broken and there be an intermixing that no one can tell the difference between the children of light and the children of darkness. So if you are able and willing, will you please stand as we read the Word of God this morning? I'll be reading verses 11 through 21. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father and the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, Lord, I, I beg and plead that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that your word will go forth in your power and your might. That, that as your children, we will listen to the words of our Father, the words of our Sovereign. And by your power, that we might implement them in our lives. That the world would see that we are your children that we love you above all else, that we love your word, that we love each other. And Father, that we love those that are outside of you because we are desperate for them to be in Christ. Lord, we want to be under physicians, as it were, seeking out those who are sick in need of healing. Not a healing that we can give through our own wisdom, but the healing that comes through you, Lord Jesus. The healing that declares the sinner righteous, that they might stand before the Father and he shall say, welcome unto my rest. That is our heart's desire for those that are outside of Christ. Lord, pray for our nation. 
we pray for a revival. Lord, a revival not only in this land, but in all the world. Not a, re a, a, a revival of moralism. Not a revival of legalism or license but a revival of those who claim the name of Christ. Lord, I pray this morning that you would be glorified, that my words would be clear, and if there's any error, Lord, that you would send a brother or sister to provide loving correction. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So last week, the message was entitled, oil and vinegar, or vinegar and oil. I already can't remember. How's that for uh, good memory? This week, I want to take a look at what it means to live as light. Now, I, I want to start. I, I, I didn't finish my message last week where I had thought I would, so I, I'm going to kind of start where I was last week, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I, I just want to make sure that we're, we're clear about this point. When Paul writes to take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, we kind of looked at trying to determine if this was written to believers or to unbelievers. And I spent a little bit of time um, unpacking this a little bit. And it's interesting to me because I, I think it's important that we, that we again be reminded, that I again be reminded that I, I need to live my life in such a way that those around me might say of me, as they said of Jesus, that I am a friend of tax collectors, a friend of sinners, but that those around me would understand how much I love the Lord Jesus Christ, how much I love God, and how much I love his word, and how I, I desire to honor him with all the things that I do. And, and just as we get started, for, for us to think about how this works, how do we handle when someone who is our, our, our friend who we know that they are not in Christ, and yet they tell a dirty joke. And I, I think about, you know, whether or not if I, if I say something to them about this joke, will it cut off my future opportunities for witness? How can I be tactful and yet show those people around me that that are my acquaintances and at some level are my friends, that what they're, what they're doing is not in line with what God's word says. Do I somehow have to be perfect in my life in order to be able to feel qualified to share with those around me the joy that I have in Christ? And I hope it would become abundantly clear to us that obviously none of us is perfect. Who is the only one that is perfect? Jesus, God. None of you are perfect, regardless of what your parents told you when you were younger. And so when people will accuse us, when we, when we stand for truth and people accuse us of being hypocrites, uh, when the people I worked with, I would simply respond with, yes. I am the king of inconsistencies. Yes, I'm a hypocrite. But I am one that Jesus has forgiven who died for me, that I might stand before his father, guiltless and blameless, not by my own accord, but of his. And so when we live our lives, we live our lives in such a way that, that our life itself is exposing the deeds of darkness. But I, I think far too often, as is re, reflected in this quote from John MacArthur, that we don't really spend a lot of time exposing sin, even among believers. Now, I'll, I'll just read this so I be, don't mangle his words. It says, many Christians do not expose and rebuke evil because they do not take it seriously. 
They laugh and joke about things that are unadulterated wickedness, that are immoral and ungodly in the extreme. They recognize the sinfulness of those things and would likely never participate in them, but they enjoy them vicariously from a distance. In so doing, they not only fail to be an influence against evil, but are instead influenced by it, contaminated by it to the full extent that they think and talk about it without exposing it and rebuking it. And there's so many things and as, as, as that could be talked about here. And, and there are things in my life that, that I've really struggled with about knowing what is the right response. What is, as a believer, what happens? How do I live this way that, that I live in such a way that it exposes the issues of the world around me. On Wednesday, we talked about how Jesus came to appeal to the unrighteous, to appeal to the sick. And we can't offer healing to someone unless they know that they're in need of healing. And this is just something that I've struggled with, and I'll just share, share it with you. Many of you may remember something called the TV Guardian, which uh, replaced inappropriate words with, I don't know if the right word is synonyms or something more appropriate. The absurdity of what I was doing was brought forth to me when I was watching the movie Martin Luther. And the word God was in there often, but it would change it because that was offensive. And I wonder sometimes, am I living a life that exposes the world to its sin if I'm finding ways to do and participate in the exact same things that they're doing by simply cutting out the parts that are not pleasing to God? And I'm not saying this in order to strike too close to home. But I wonder when, when I watch something like Game of Thrones through VidAngel or some other service that, that cuts out all of the bad parts because I feel like I'm missing out so that I can have some way of talking with my unbelieving friends. And I... I just feel in my heart that, and I'm not saying that if you use those kind of things that, that you're wrong, but if, in my, for me, between me and God, I don't like those things because I want for my unbelieving friends to realize that I don't partake in exactly the same things that they partake in. It's something I've shared before, my, my friend Ernie was one of the best movie reviewers that I ever knew because he would go see a movie and I'd be like, oh, how was it? He says, it's not something you would go see. And yet I would talk to my friends who were believers and they had gone to see it. And I remember thinking more than once how sad it was that my unbelieving friend, my grandfather would say a pagan who was working at it, knew that it was not something that I would watch. And yet other believers would watch it and say it was fine. And I'm not saying there aren't things that we have in common, but if I'm doing that, am I not shining a light for Christ? Or am I simply putting shades over it as many times as I, can't, as I can so that I'm not offensive to the people around me? The unbelievers around us should not think that we hate them. They should know that we love them, but that we love them so much that we want them to be well. And the, the next point is this idea that, that the light, the light of God, the light of Christ shines through us. Verses 13 and 14 of chapter 5 says, When anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The idea of, of, of visible things, it becomes manifest. 
when the when the light of our life, our our light of our love for God, the light of our, our life for love for His Word shines a light on the things that other people do, and God, by the power of His Holy Spirit, can use those things to draw people to Himself. It's very clear in God's Word that that people do not hear the gospel unless someone tells them about it. And how can I tell them about it if I'm always living a life that avoids it? Now, I I will confess as I studied this, this this becomes a a difficult part to understand. But in my heart, I I really feel like what, what Paul is saying here is we get to this point because when we're living for Christ, when we're doing the things that he's asked us to do, when, when we are not chasing after what the world says is pleasurable, it is a proclamation of the gospel to those who are around us that are living in darkness. I shared this last week, this idea that, that we walk as a child of light, maintaining proper separation from the world and proper contact with the world. We don't, we don't cloister ourselves in monasteries and convents. We don't, we don't wall ourselves off from the world around us. So we do have contact, but at the same time, we, we put up warning things or barriers around us. We have accountability with you as my brothers and sisters to point out things in my life that are suddenly not what they should be. On the way to church this morning, I listened to a song um, by DC Talk called What If I Stumble? And it talks about the thing that an unbelieving world just can't believe are Christians who profess Christ with their mouth and deny them with their lives. And I never want to be said of me that my life is characterized by denying my Savior. But how does this look? What is the practicalness of this? What does it mean to walk in the light? What does it mean to, I call it, light walk? What is that characterized by? And I really believe that as we start here in in verse 15 of chapter 5, and it goes all the way to chapter 6, verse 9, that Paul is giving those at Ephesus, and by extension, all believers, here is how it looks to walk as light. This is what it looks like to walk in a way that those around you who are not in the light become exposed to the gospel. And it's one of my things, I can't remember now who said it, it was a a church father who said, you know, share the gospel at every opportunity, and if necessary, use words, which had that idea of, of, of living our life. But I, I, in my heart, I, I've, I've come to realize that sometimes we as believers use as a cop out to not use words. I need to not just live it. I need to speak it. Listen, I, I worked in the secular workplace for, since I was 14 years old. And if you live for the Lord, they know what you're doing. And God will give you opportunities to speak and shine the light. It doesn't mean that they always respond. But in these next couple of weeks, I, I, I want myself to actually look at my life. And there's a, there's a point this morning that, that if, I, if I was selfish, I would just skip it. But when we come to it, I'm going to have to deal with it. And it's one that when the word says is a living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, pierces me. We'll get to it. But what does it mean to have a life that's marked by light? Dr. MacArthur, I think his seminary has a preach as if lives depended on it. Well, the reality is we preach because lives do depend on it. The idea for me, as we look at this, these next passages, is that we need to live as if lives depend on it. Now listen, I, I don't save anybody. You don't save anybody. It's only the Holy Spirit that saves you. And I'm not 
in any ways talking about self-effort. I want to pour over this, the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but it, this is not about self-effort. This is not about me convincing someone to be saved by my own wisdom and my own tactfulness, my own force of personality. But the reality is Paul, God through Paul tells us, hey, if you're living in the light, these are the things that, you, that come out in your life. And they, they can be different for each of us. There's, there's things that are even different now in my life than when I was 25. So let's take a look at these. And this is, this is what it means to be marked by a light walk is going to take me several weeks to get through. And I don't want to rush, but I also don't want to go too, too Terry, too long. But I, I want to make sure that I'm accurate to what God wants us to know, what he wants. Well, I've told you this before. What God wants me to know, and then I just tell you what he's been teaching me. Um, one of the first things that we need to look at is, is look carefully. A life that is lived for Jesus, a life, a life that is lived in the light is one that is lived with careful attention. Now, these two words here I, I find interesting, and, and it is also interesting to me that the way it's translated uh, if you have the ESV, the third word is then. I think, is it the NIV that says therefore? There's, there's one translation that starts verse 15 with the word therefore. The word then has that idea. We've looked before, we looked last week. Paul loved this therefore, this idea of because of these other things. And so we've just come from this section about, about living godly lives, about, about living our light out loud. And he says, therefore, you children of God, those followers of Christ, therefore, do these things. And the first thing is look carefully. And the idea of, of look has the idea of to be ready to learn about future dangers or needs. It has the idea or implication of learning so that you will be prepared to respond appropriately. And then carefully has this idea of being, uh, being deliberate in manner to compare to a standard. And so I, I think Paul saying what it, what it says to me is, that, therefore, Joe, look at your life. Look at how you live. Look at the situations that you come in contact with. Look at it through the lens of God's eyes. Look at it through the lens of his word so that you can learn. How many of you know more now than you did five years ago? When I was 30, I was amazed at how much my parents learned between my ages of 20 and 30. They had gone to a master class on adulting. Did they really learn a lot between my ages of 20 and 30? Well, they did. But I just began to realize they already knew a lot. For us as believers... We are forever learning about what it means to walk for Christ. If, if, if you looked at a reel of my life, you would see so many inconsistencies. Fits and starts that as I, I study God's word, there's things that I, I would jettison from my life, and then things that I would bring back into my life, things that I would, would start to do, and then I would stop to do. Because as we grow and we learn the word of God, as we learn and grow in the Holy Spirit and his power, things in our life change. I really pray that I am not the same person at the day that I go to see the Lord than I am now. I am grateful that I am not the same person that I was when I was 20. But we need to be paying careful attention. I need to watch how I walk. I need to watch where I walk. H.C.G. Mool says this, Paul, as he has to appeal again for a grave remembrance that the walk in the light is no mere promenade, smooth and easy, but a march resolved and full of purpose, cautious against the enemy, watchful for opportunity for the king, self-controlled in every habit, and, the po and possible only, if it is to be a reality, in the power of the eternal spirit. But there's just one part here that just really gets me. It's, a, it's this idea of being watchful 
or cautious against the enemy, watchful for opportunity for the king. And I was thinking like, man, what a way to approach how I live my life. To, to be on guard against the wiles of the enemy. To be, be on guard of the, his sneaky approaches. Satan is not all-knowing, but he can watch. He knows where I am weak. He knows where you are weak. And he uses, and so we, we need to be really thinking. We need to be learning. I may, you know, I, when I was in youth ministry, I used to always say, like, I'll try anything twice. Not a good idea when it comes to sin. Um, but this idea that, that in my mind is that I need to learn. He may get me once or twice, but I need to learn from that. I need to move forward. And guess who helps me in that? You. You know who the, one of the biggest helps in this church has ever been in my life? You. And four million little chocolate donuts which you can ask pastor about that. But we, listen, we need someone who we give the right to say to us, hey, I read your Facebook post. That's just wrong. You need to delete it. Hey, I heard you talk to your spouse. Dear one, that's not good. I, I just think we, we are so desperate to, in the American dream of being individuals, but we, we lose sight of the fact that, that one of the beauties of the body of Christ is that we can hold each other accountable. And I, and I think in my heart, just as, as with unbelievers, it isn't whack-a-mole. I mean, if you want to play whack-a-mole with me, you don't have to watch me long to be able to whack me. But it's so that we can grow together, that we can become more Christ-like, that we, that we can have eyes that are spiritually open. And you help me with that. We help each other with that. So this first thing is we need to be careful, paying careful attention. We cannot go through our Christian life simply sauntering along, thinking we got it under control. When I graduated from high school, my cousin Jack gave me a, a card for graduation. And I thought it was a really, I didn't think it was an insightful card when I was 18, but I thought it was pretty insightful by the time I got older. It said, now that you believe you know it all, quickly write it all down before you realize you don't. Is that not kind of how we work? We're young, we're arrogant. We think we got it all figured out. God puts a little age on us and gives us a little wisdom. And we realize there were times in my life when I wasn't very careful. I wasn't very diligent. I wasn't thinking about learning for the future. And God is saying, no, you need to learn for the future. So we do this carefully. We do this with careful attention. Next, we do it. We live as light with knowledge and discernment. It says, look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. And it's interesting that the word for wise is sophos, and the word for unwise is asophos. So you can kind of figure out if you're even not a language expert, one is the positive side of it, and the other is the negative side of it. And the idea there is that accumulating knowledge and or discernment. The idea of asaphos is that you do not ever accumulate knowledge or discernment. You go through life, and you're no different at 50 than you were at 20. And so as a person who lives in the light, I am always learning. Hebrews chapter 5, excuse me, 12 through 14. Um, I'll start in verse 13. It says, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. As one musical theologian said, you can't know the word of God if you're never in it. And so I gain knowledge from the word of God. 
I gain knowledge by seeing how godly people live their lives. I learn from godly people's mistakes. We all know this to be true. Ignorance is not bliss. The other thing is not just knowledge and discernment by the study of God's word, but James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8 says very clear. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. You know, for us, what we end up doing, we live life the way we think it needs to be lived. And I'm reminded of the verse, I think it's in Proverbs, it says there's a way that seems right unto man, but in the end it leads to death. I must always have this check of my life of what the word of God says. And we were talking in Sunday school this morning you know, there are things in God's word that are really, really difficult to understand. And, and I, I know somebody had asked me when I was first becoming lead pastor, they, they, they desperately wanted me to teach on a certain book because they, they thought like, well, this is just so important for us to know. And I said, you know, I really want to teach through the pastoral epistles first and, and the epistles to the churches, because honestly, those things, how does it affect how I live my life? If I'm right about eschatology, does it change how I live my life? Or am I want to be right about eschatology so that I can tell you you're wrong? And I'm not saying eschatology isn't important. I'm not saying soteriology isn't important. But listen, I'm convinced I can, I can spend the rest of my earthly life from Acts to Jude or 3 John trying to live a life that honors my heavenly father. But I need to make sure that I'm gaining this knowledge and I'm gaining this discernment. And, and this is 14 in, in Hebrews chapter 5. It's, it's a thing that I think is missing in the Western world for believers. It says, but solid food is for, for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. I am concerned that there are many Christians, those who are truly in Christ, who no longer can tell good from evil. Tell right from wrong. A couple people sent me a story this week how a faction or a group of the Mennonite church has now decided that LGBTQ is perfectly acceptable. And they now, they, I think one of the things that I struggle the most with is they were asking for forgiveness because they, they said the words that they used against the LGBT community about there only being two genders and that there being man and woman and being marriage women was violence to that group. Listen, we need to teach God's word. We need to do it in a way that is compassionate and understanding. How many of us were not sinners before Christ? Were we not all sinners? Is it not only by the grace of God that we're in Christ? But we need to tell them the truth. We can't simply give in in order to be liked. So living, living as light has this idea of knowledge and discernment. And I think as it talks about this accumulation, we get more and more of it. We get more and more of it, and we're better off. And I think it's also why the word tells us older men teach younger men. Older women teach younger women. You know, I, I lived through, and I don't know if it still goes on because I don't pay a whole lot of attention but uh, there was this movement for a while that if, if you were over the age of 50, you were, knew nothing. And it was only the young people who knew anything. And on the other end of the spectrum was the people over 50 were like, oh, those people under 50 know absolutely nothing. We're the ones who know it all. You know, that's not how God envisions the body of Christ. 
I have a lot. To, I learned a lot from teenagers in my years in youth ministry. I hope and pray that they learn something from me. We need each other, regardless of our age. If we're in Christ, we need each other. The other thing that is, that is true of, of walking in the light is time redemption. So look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. And then in Colossians, of course, finally it says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. And it's interesting to me, this making the best use of has the idea of buying back. It has this idea of, of working urgently to redeem the time. And, it, and I find it interesting because the word time does mean time, but it also has the idea of the opportune time, the idea that the, that the time is suitable ad or advantageous for a particular purpose. And in my heart, I'm thinking like, well, that makes sense to me. I need to make the best use of this opportunity that I have because this time is right and ripe for the sharing of the gospel of Jesus Christ with an unsaved world. When the end comes and there's a new heaven and a new earth, that is not the apt time to share the gospel. Not that I don't think we won't hear the gospel in heaven, but the time for a response will have passed. And so in my heart, and I'm hoping I'm not stretching this, but, it's, but, but Paul is telling us, listen, you need to, to not walk as unwise people. You need to walk as wise because, listen, now is the time that you need to live as light so the unsaved world can see it and that by the power of the Holy Spirit, people will get saved. And he reminds those at Ephesus, because the days are evil. And listen, the days have been evil ever since the ark. We, we seem to have this, uh, this book by Carl Edwards, we seem to have this, like, this view of the good old days. And then when we research the good old days, they weren't really the good old days. They were just the old days. Do we not think that the world has not had enough evil to go around in any time frame? Our days are evil. The days at the time of Ephesus were evil. And so we need to make the best use of this opportunity to share and live the gospel for those around us. And sadly for me, I think I've been swept up in the, the world's view of, of time. I'm not, I'm not talking about, I'm just talking now about Western time. We're, 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 uh, Western world is all about leisure. We're, we're all about time wasting. It didn't take me a whole lot of uh, effort. It's one of those Google searches that you do and you get 45 million, 45 million responses. But I want to know what is it that, that people spend most of their time during the day doing? Well, we spend six and a half hours a day on the internet. We spend 3.6 hours per day, and this is America. This is from 2019. We spend 3.1 hours a day watching television. We spend 2.2 hours a day texting and email. This next one, I think we, I think we all just lied when they asked us this question. 1.7 hours a day playing video games, 0.75 hours a day arguing. Anybody want to take me on? No, just kidding. Um, I'm not sure about that. In total, and, that, and there were other things that people listed, but this is 17.9 hours per day. If you sleep for eight hours, guess what? You've got more than 24 hours. I don't, know if the, I don't know if the people who respond to this don't work. You know, it, it, it's, there's only, what was what there left? So 18, there's only 6.1 hours left. And I understand there may be 
overlaps and, and things of that nature. And it depends on different people, different age groups. Apparently, people over 70 spend up to nine hours a day watching television. And I'm like, Do that, is that nine hours a day with the TV on or actually watching it, right? How much of this is, is overlapped? If you take playing video games and you take it away from the console and include it on any device, it's closer to five or six hours a day. This was a hard thing for me because I feel like I wasted an awful lot of time. I hear people say, well, I, I don't have time to do my devotions. I don't have time to take my spouse on a date. I don't have time for these different things. That is the very wise Dan Seeger said, we have time for what we want. And I, I want, and I understand there's, there's, a, there's a balance here. Even God said you work six days and you rest one. Elijah had an incredible battle with the, the prophets of Baal. And God didn't rebuke him for needing a rest. And, and so, you know, I, I think there are times. This is going to sound very odd to you. I had way more energy when I worked outside all day long than when I became a supervisor and sat at a computer reading all day. I could go home and do all sorts of things when I worked outside all day for eight, nine hours. But I was mentally whooped from reading reports and the like, and I'd get home and, and honestly, I would waste a lot of time because my brain just couldn't function. And so I'm, I'm not saying here that, that, that we can't rest, that, that every moment of every second has to be taken up necessarily in the things of God. But I know I need to do a better job with the way I use my time. This was written by Thomas Watson, who passed away in 1686, so a couple, couple weeks ago. It says this, many people fool away their time, some in idle visits, others in recreations and pleasures which secretly bewitch the heart and take it away from better things. What are our golden hours for but to attend to our souls? And this, I have this because it's got me. Time misspent is not time lived, but time lost. And that just kind of pierced me to the heart. We're all about self-care. We're all about living for ourselves. But I need to do a better job of spending my time wisely for God. Next, I, I want to... Well, I guess since I'm going for three weeks, it doesn't matter if I finish or not. Um, the next thing is we need to be responsive to God's will. We, we need to do not be foolish. Do not, like, do not be devoid of wisdom. Do not be devoid of good sense. Do not be devoid, devoid of good judgment. It says, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Psalm 14.1 says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. But well, we don't want to be a fool. And the idea of the, the present imperative of this word says that, that we are making it our continual job of seeking and comprehending what God's will is for our life. And we've talked about this a long time, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but really the way we can figure out God's will is by spending time in his word. We need to spend time in his word. The other thing is, is that we need to be wholly 
spirit-filled. It says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, now it's, it's actually interesting. The word debauchery has the idea of spending or using excessively. So, so it's not this idea that I, I need to not be spending and, and, and using excessively for the world. I need to be filled with the Spirit. And honestly, I could do an entire message on what does it mean to be filled by the Holy Spirit or filled with the Holy Spirit. The idea of, of filled is to be generously supplied with. To me, what, what this is telling me is that as I'm every morning, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to fill me and to guide me. This is not some mystical thing that I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit's voice to come into my head and telling me what to do. It's not about speaking in some language that nobody knows, but it's asking the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit to give me the power to live the life that he's called me to. It's me begging the Holy Spirit to make his gifts manifest in my life so that I can use them for others and not for making a name for myself. I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I need to be filled with His power and not my own. In some circles, this idea of being filled and led by the Holy Spirit goes contrary to what Scripture says. Some people use the idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit as being, hey, look at me, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at all the great things that I can do. But sometimes I, I, I'm convinced that truly living completely filled with the Holy Spirit, completely releasing myself to the Holy Spirit may mean that I live a very peaceful and quiet life for God that he gives me gifts for the body of Christ, for the edification of my brothers and sisters, not for the building up of myself. But listen again, I can't be filled with the Holy Spirit if I'm busy pushing him out. The Holy Spirit is not an authoritarian Holy Spirit. He will only give you the power if you want it. He's not forcing himself in. And I, I would encourage you, and, and I, I want you to be very careful because there's a lot of bad material out there, but do some study in the Scripture. About what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? What are the fruits of the Spirit? What does my life look like if I'm walking in step with the Spirit? And we've had many, many really good messages about that over the years. But as we close... It's something that the Lord was laying on my heart as over the last couple of weeks as I was studying and getting ready for this series of messages. Is brothers and sisters, we need to shine. Matthew 5.16 says this. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And it, it's important for me to understand. Is it, let's see if I can just get this out in a way that makes sense. I think sometimes Western evangelicalism thinks that we can get people to glorify God by diminishing our light. By saying, you know, I don't know if I want to do that because someone will be offended. Well, don't worry, God, Jesus told us very clearly, you live for me. The, people, the world is going to absolutely love you and think you're terrific. They're going to be like, oh, yeah, please give me more of that. No, what does the word tell us? The world's going to hate us. Because it hated him first. But it does, we, we have to, I have to live like light. My city has to be lit by how I live for God. And that does mean that unbelievers and even some believers alike will be offended. But how would I rather live? 
Would I rather live a life that doesn't offend people or a life that somehow by the power of the Holy Spirit, people will see how we live and the Holy Spirit will be able to use that to bring them to repentance so that they can add their light to ours and force out the darkness. Put this verse somewhere where you can see it this week, Matthew 5, 16. And remind yourself to let the light of Christ shine through you to the world around you. And filter all of your social media posts, all the things that you do, and say, am I shining the light of Christ? Or am I diminishing it? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And I, I know, Father, I live in a time, and I'm guilty of it too, that I want to figure out how I want to live. I don't want someone telling me what to do. It's, in a sense, our American DNA. Father, forgive me when I do not yield to your word. I'm thankful. I'm so grateful, Lord, that your mercy is, is lavished upon me, that your grace is boundless, that I am never condemned. But Holy Spirit, help me to live a life that is full of light. And Holy Spirit, I beg you, beg you that you will allow that light to be used in some way that others will glorify God and that they will be brought to the point of repentance and that there will be new brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God. It's in your precious name, Lord Jesus, that I pray. Amen. He is risen. You are dismissed.